Hey everybody, this is the BS Podcast Network. I'm Ben Dorst. Steven Dominguez. At least this show is better than pure BS. Wh- what? Who are you? I'm Batman. Who are you? My name is Bond. Bond. I'm Batman. His name's Bond. James Bond. I am Batman. Bond. James, James Bond. Bond. I'm Batman. Bond. 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 I'm Batman. This is the Batman vs. James Bond Show. The show covering everything related to Batman and James Bond movies. And now, here's your host, Brian Thomas. Hello everyone and welcome back to an all new episode of the Batman vs. James Bond Show. The name's Thomas, Brian Thomas, and I am your host. And this is a show where we discuss everything related to Batman and James Bond movies. It is great to be back. I hope all of you have had a fantastic week. Mine was great. Um, yeah, just getting that last vacation in for the summertime. Uh, just a little bit of beach time in, so to speak. And, uh, you know, the biggest thing right now I'm doing, and this is a, you know, preview of, or what do they call it? Um, behind the curtains kind of thing about what's going on behind the scenes of the Batman vs. James Bond show. If I haven't mentioned before, I'm getting in or more into cosplay in the last year or so. So, I'm creating my Batman costume as we speak, almost. Um, no, don't worry, I'm not putting it together as I'm doing the show. But right before the show, less than an hour or so, um, let's put it this way. I uh, bought the body armor suit, the torso armor, and the leg stuff, and I post on Instagram at Batman vs. Bond. Make a long story short, I have to have something to glue it onto. So I bought a compression suit, and it's all black compression suit. And the problem is, though, the back doesn't have a zipper to it. So... I have I'm covered in saran wrap. I'm covered in two layers of clothing and including the compression suit. My wife is gluing this suit to my back and she's like, how are you going to get it off, Brian? I'm like, Duh, um, didn't think of that. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that that's the second or third time this is, suit has failed me. And, uh, you know, it's you know, what do we say? What did Batman say in um, The Dark Knight when he was talking to Alfred? Helps me learn from my mistakes. So what do I have to do? Well, I went on Amazon and I just ordered a compression suit that's a, one of those Zentai zipper suits. But you're not so much worried about that. But what you should be worried about is where you can find the Batman versus James Bond show. And I'm glad you asked. Yes, it is now part of the BS Podcast Network. That is right. You can now find my show and a whole bunch of other great shows on bspodnetwork.com. Shout out to Stephen and Ben over there. They have a great show called Pure BS Podcast. It's an uncensored, expect anything kind of show. And they talk a little bit about everything, including Batman. Haven't heard him mention James Bond yet, aside from mentioning this show. But uh, maybe sooner or later they will. Um, before we get things started, I'd like to remind everyone to please subscribe to the Batman vs. James Bond show on iTunes and leave a nice little review for me. Two things that I always ask, um, or if I'm asking for anything now, this is the time. One, of course, go on there, subscribe, and leave a nice review for me. Share the episode, okay? That is a big thing for me right now. Please share this episode. So, you know, even if even if you haven't listened to this week's episode, if you're listening to this episode right now, pause it, okay? I don't mind. Pause it, and then on social media, whatever you use, if it's Facebook, Twitter, whatever, just share it and just let your friends know, hey, there's a Batman and James Bond show out there because I'm getting this a lot more now saying, or comments saying, a Batman and James Bond show? I never knew it existed. I would have listened to this before. Well, it wasn't created till about March of this year but either way though a lot of people don't know about this show so help spread the word that would be a big big help for me i really appreciate that and as always a quick disclaimer i always like to throw out before every show especially for the new listeners welcome glad to have you i am not a movie critic and i'm not a blogger for a movie site and i am obviously not a professional cosplayer or else i would have bought the right zentai suit with a zipper there we go. I got that out of the way. But I am a guy who is obsessed with Batman and James Bond, and I say it every single show, and I can't stress this enough. Um, just so you new listeners especially know what you're getting yourself into, it's a fan show. It, that's exactly what it is. If, if somebody were asked what the Batman versus James Bond show is, it's more movie-centric. Um, it's not so much geared towards comics. I, I, I do love comics, but not as much as some of the other fans out there. So if they say, well, it, it, it's not like the comics, well, that's okay. I'm not. I'm not. It's not medicine insult to you at all. It's just that I am a movie guy, and you know these movies just they affect my way of life, how I do things, and so forth. I mean, I'm 
quoting these movies all the time. And yeah, I have my favorites, but I mean, I can't, I can't get enough of them. So that's why I do this. So um, having said that, so, you know, normally I would say, let's get right into news. And yes, I know that there's, for those of you that haven't seen this, Ben Affleck tweeted a picture of a certain villain out there. He goes by the name of Slade Wilson, better known as Deathstroke. Yes, I'm well aware of that. Um, you know, he he tweeted out as like I guess it's an onset pic. You see him like taking a video from his cell phone, and then he's looking at a screen, and we see Deathstroke. And I already had a big show planned out for this. Um, yeah, so you know we'll get back into news next week. Um, you know I will be talking more about Baltimore Comic Con. That is, um, that is coming up this weekend for all you local uh, Marylanders, Pennsylvania. Delaware, Delaware, DC, get over to Baltimore Comic Con. There's still tickets available, as far as I know. Um, we are not here to talk about Comic Con, and no, we are not here to talk about Deathstroke tonight. We are here tonight to talk about allies, okay? So, yeah, whenever we think of these heroes, whenever we think of James Bond, and whenever we think of Batman, we always, or at least I always refer to them as like, just somebody who doesn't have to rely on a partner, okay? They are a, he's not, I mean, sure, if you want to think about the Adam West Batman, sure, he had Robin with him. If you want to think of Clooney Batman, well, that doesn't exist in this podcast. No, I'm kidding. Um, yes, there was Robin, and there was even Batgirl in there. Maybe I'll even talk about them tonight, finally. Um, no, when we think of these superheroes, and I call James Bond a superhero because, yeah, he's still standing after 50 plus years. Um, you know, it, they rely, you know, sure, they have all their gadgets and so forth, and they, you know, they, they're they very intelligent and they're very, most of the time, they're very strong too, but um, they still rely on some help. And that's why I really want to talk about this tonight. It's the people in the background, you know, there's people over there in, um, you know, in the back cave, for example, there's Q branch, maybe even too. And, you know, I really want to focus on these characters because these are kind of like the unsung heroes in a way. And when I was researching this, cause I had to go back because believe it or not, there were so many that I missed that are most that I forgot. And I'm like, Oh my goodness. I didn't realize there were so many in such one of these movies or a couple of these movies. So I'm going to go down the list very similar to how I did the villains episode. It's not going to be, you know, as long, it's not going to be broken up into two parts like villains was, cause I really think I can get this into one episode. I'm going to do my best because there are a lot of reoccurring characters after a while. So, and you'll notice, I'll just mention the ones that are new to that certain film. And so forth. So let's go all the way back. Start off with Dr. No. All right. So you with me? Okay, good. So let's start with Dr. No. Um, th- the main, probably what I would consider as one of the biggest allies ever on screen. And remember, we're going all the way back to 1962 with this. Okay. So that's like one of, and, you know, and this is the James Bond franchise that is. And, you know, Batman was still around, but he hasn't hit quite the big screen yet as far as I remember, and I should know this because I don't remember when the first Batman film was. I believe it was 1966. Um, no, I'm not going to be able to mention that because I want to do a full review of that movie another time. I always say that, but I will. I am a, I'm a man right word. And um, so moving back to Dr. No here, the main, the biggest ally of them all is clearly Felix Slater. Um, you know, and I will talk, I will mention my top favorite, top five favorite allies at the very end of this episode. Um, Felix Slater um, was portrayed by Jack Lord. And for those of you, you know, from Batman fans that don't know this, shame on you. Go back and watch all these James, classic James Bond movies because they are an influence onto the Batman movies that you watch this very um, time or for this very day. Um, Felix Slater was a CIA. Uh, CIA operative and um, you know he's pretty much the American James Bond that's the best way I can put it um, when James Bond is you know in um, in Dr. No when he's investigating the um, why the station broke um, contact and so forth in Jamaica James Bond is investigating and so forth and all of a sudden he crosses paths with Felix Slater who's played by Jack Lord Jack Lord if you um, for those of you if you um, go back there's a TV show called Hawaii Five O. no I'm not talking about the one that's you know on t- TV right now there's a classic Hawaii Five O, and that Jack Lord character was the main star in this I don't know what his name is in this but I'm talking about him on Felix Slater as Felix Slater and um this guy, I mean, you know, James Bond, you know, we, we talked last week about how smooth and how confident Sean Connery is. Well, Jack Lord portrayed it almost in the same identical way. And just, you know, he he sneaks up on James Bond in the first encounter. And, you know, James Bond, you know, Sean Connery's holding his Walter PPK after he fights these two guys at the bar. And he thinks James Bond thinks he's in control. What happens? He backs up into this Walter. And... 
PPK and it's you know held by Felix Slater and um he's like hold it and you know Sean Connery's like oh crap what happened who is this guy and what have I gotten myself into now well it ends up being that Felix Slater is CIA and you know um he recognizes that the gun identifies himself and says hey we're pretty much on the same team here and then they end up working together and this relationship ends up going on for well at least to at least 2008 i believe it is right now um you know this character has been around since 1962 and you know minus however long it was in the book so i'm talking about on screen okay but um i love the rapport that these guys have they really respect each other um they can joke around to a point or whatever but they both take their jobs very seriously um you know if any time i think felix slider um i'll definitely say jack lord the actor comes to mind or just that image of him and i can't get enough of of you know just how he's how he carries himself you know he wears the kind of suits that bond does he's wearing the sunglasses as he's holding the walther ppk or his walther ppk and i just it's like man this guy is so cool be like you know wow i love it um so that's definitely one of the biggest allies ever at least in the james bond universe but like i said i'm gonna have my top five and maybe he might just make it into the list um you can't ha- talk about allies without talking about you know uh, James Bond's boss, um, M, and he's portrayed in this first film or the first series of films by Bernard Lee. Um, for those of you that don't know, M is the head of the British Secret Service, MI6. Now, M is um, just like any other boss. He, you know, he, he, I don't know. He, it's like he tolerates and it's this relationship that he's always had with James Bond up until his final film, Bernard Lee was m he portrayed this character all the way from 1962 and dr no all the way up until moonraker which was his final film um you know and he got to um be the head of of MI6 or the british secret service for three different james bonds um we'll talk about another m who well she didn't make it as far with that she was only of two but i'm getting ahead of myself here anyway bernard lee i what the part i loved especially in dr no is how do you introduce james bond's boss well you know bond is summoned to his office or to mi6 headquarters in the middle of the night 3 a.m bernard lee's just sitting there he's smoking his pipe and you know he's in his office he's in i believe he was in a um he was in a bow tie and kind of like a red jacket if i'm not mistaken and he just has this you know he's very he's very serious he takes himself very seriously 007 it's 3 a.m what um when on earth do you sleep never on the firm's time never on the firm's time yes sir and you know um just how he acts with bonds like okay you know i'm your boss um you know i'm the new section chief you know this is how i run things if you don't like how i run things then get the hell out of here pretty much and even down to his gun and that's you know i'm i'm, I'm mixing this in also um you know um the biggest you know and it's kind of mixing it with gadgets i know and i don't want to get into gadgets but it kind of will um bernard and you know m makes this comment about saying um take um take off your jacket and you know he has major boothroyd come in and who is the head of q branch okay now a lot of people might think when they hear q branch what do you think of you think of desmond llewellyn well that is true okay but there was actually a the first q was played by peter burton um now he's never called Q in this, but you know he actually does come in in Doctor No. He's playing you know the same character of Major Boythroyd, and he comes in and he's bringing he brings us in or he introduces the gun of all guns, the Walther PPK to 007. Now the reason what made this so special, I think for me anyway, is the fact that M called 007 out on this. He said that damn Beretta again and you know Sean Connery it has some kind of attachment to it and so forth and didn't want to get rid of it clearly but you know M says since I've been the head of section chief you know fatalities or death has gone down or whatever if you carry a double O number you carry um double O issued weapon you carry the Walther PPK um Major explained it to him, and you know he goes into all that or whatever. But I love that interaction in that office. Um, you know, he, he actually Bond um, even wanted, didn't even want, like I said, he didn't want to give up the Beretta, so he he just kind of leaves it there. He tried to even sneak out of the office with it, and it didn't end up working so well. But at the same time, you can tell that you know um, 
M he does respect Bond, but he just he knows like the reputation that he has. And mind you, we're kind of seeing it through M's eyes in a way too, saying, "Okay, well, you know, here it is, this suave, sophisticated guy, you know, secret agent, and three a.m. and he thinks he can do whatever he want, and he thinks he's going to carry this kind of gun, and he thinks he can do whatever, but not on my watch. This is how it is." So. I have much love for Bernard Lee as M. He, he is, you know, whenever I think of M, I still think of him as M also. Um, Luis Maxwell, and this is going into Bond Girl territory also, but I, I feel like I have to mention her. Um, and I'm not making it sound like a chore because I love Miss Moneypenny. I loved Luis Maxwell as Miss Moneypenny. She is just, her character, um, Miss Moneypenny is the secretary of M once again. Um, you know, just that that playful relationship that she had even since the very beginning with um sean connery's james bond it was just um you know james it's 3 a.m where have you been and so forth you never take me out to dinner looking like that you never take me to dinner at all well, i would but and would have me court martialed for illegal use of uh government property and um see bad sean connery impression again i gave him my best shot i'm gonna keep working on it um you know, once again, Louise Maxwell, she played uh, Miss Moneypenny all the way up to um, her last one was A View to a Kill in 1985. So she was been has been with the franchise for such a long time. And like I said, going all the way back to 1962, she's been playing this character. And, you know, she is iconic for playing this character because she, I like I said, it's not just a secretary. And at that time, you have to think about, okay, well, sure, it could be sexist to say, Oh well, the female secretary flirting with the you know the you know the suave uh, secret agent coming through, yeah. But Money Penny could hold her own though, especially this Money Penny. It's she got tough with him, and she kind of you know she you know knew when to give it to him, but she still flirted with him at the same time. Yeah, you know can't blame a girl for trying that kind of deal, or whatever. But she still you know she knew yeah how Bond was. But like I said, I think she kind of teased with him, saying, "Yeah, you could. I want you to take me out to dinner, but I'm never even going to give you that chance." So let's move on here to, um, you know, as, you know, Bond is in Crab Key, you know, he's collect, he's trying to figure out what's going on with Dr. No. And he finds, um, as he met, right before he met Felix Slater, he actually met a character named Coral. Now, Coral was a, um, he was originally employed by um, Strangway, who was the one, you know, who ended up being killed at the very beginning. And spoiler alerts from 1962. Um, pretty much what Coral did is that he ran a charter fishing boat and so forth. And Bond ends up hiring him. And he's actually secretly working with Felix Slider until Bond you know, meets Felix Slider. And then they're all working together. So Coral is actually the guy who takes him out to Dr. No's Island at the Crab Key. And... Um, you know, Cora was Cora was a funny character. I mean, um, you know, I I love when Coral's describing the dragon to Double O Seven, and he's like, "It's real, Captain. I've seen it before." And um, let's get the hell out of here. And just that attitude. I mean, I felt bad for what happened to Coral at the very end. I truly did. Um, but I did. I I do like his character in there. Um, you know, he. I think he brought kind of a lighter sense to the movie in a way or just a, that i don't want to he's kind of a comic relief to a point and um you know like i said um he was a really good ally to have i mean definitely helped james bond he was definitely his backup gun but just unfortunately didn't work out for him so anyway let's move on to from russia with love okay this is where we even get into bigger allies here um Biggest ally, I can say, and a lot of you have already said this on social media um, when I posted this, when I was letting you know about this, was is Q, the Q, Desmond Llewellyn. Um, turns out the Peter Burton, who played uh, Major Boothroyd at the... Um, and Dr. No was unable to reprise his role. So actually Llewellyn stepped in for him and it ended up being for the next 36 years. How about that? All the way up until 1999 with Pierce Brosnan in the world is not enough. Now we all have our favorite Q moments. Um, the first time the Q is actually introduced in From Russia with Love is the iconic briefcase has the um, gold sovereigns in there, has the knife in there. Um, pretty much like the expo kind of like an exploding dust that comes out of the briefcase to my knowledge um you know it had a whole bunch oh and the sniper rifle of course you got to have the sniper rifle and um you know it's just that relationship once again this is the relationship that bond had with his allies and you know like i said there's so many allies especially in the james bond world but q has always been that go-to if it you know there's a saying and i'm jumping ahead of myself again in license to kill if it hadn't been for q branch you've been dead long ago and frankly you're gonna need my help well 
There you go. And another one from The World is Not Enough is saying, I've always tried to teach you two things. One, never let them see you bleed. And the second, always have an escape route. And that's exactly, you know, that really does sum up what Q stands for. And especially Desmond Llewellyn, you know, he was kind of like that. If I had to classify him, I would classify him as kind of like a kind of like a dad slash grandfather slash uncle in a way. And he kind of had that relationship saying, you know, um, I never joke about my work, 007. And um, please try to return this in pristine order. Um, You know, that kind of relationship. And like I said, it goes through on all the Bond films, even, you know, even with Roger Moore, even with um, George Lazenby, even with Timothy Dalton, that he always found a way to have that relationship with, you know, if even if it was more of a father's son, son, don't touch the toys, don't touch the gadgets when you come into my shop. And I think that's how it was played so well. And I remember Desmond Llewellyn on the interview saying, I I know nothing about gadgets, but I just, you know, make believe it that, you know, this could really happen and so forth. And I know that he had a great time doing this as or portraying this character and anytime you know we have a Q scene on here I mean I'm, I always look forward to it especially in the Bond movies of course there's a new Q now but um, I always say respect the past embrace the future you have to respect Desmond Llewellyn to what he did with, the, with as Q and think about how much of an influence Q has had even on Batman movies which we'll talk a little bit about later how you know you even see characters that are pretty much a Q in other movies and other big blockbusters and they have their gadgets and so forth. They're getting it from this guy. Well, in my mind, this is based off this character right here. And like I said, Bond influences a lot of movies. And this is definitely a character that has had an influence on not just James Bond or even Batman, but a way lot of other movies. So moving on here, another big ally and from Russia with love is Krim Bey. He was the head of the British Secret Service's Station T in Istanbul. Um, big ally for James Bond. He was portrayed by Pedro Armand. Derez, I think I pronounced that correctly. Um, you know, Karem Bay is, um, you know, I've watched From Russia With Love a decent amount of times and so forth, but I think the more I watch it, I just liked, he was, he didn't take himself too seriously. I mean, he did, but to the point where he was, you know, not as serious as, say, a Felix Slater. He's not as serious as James Bond. He was very, you know, joking and so forth. And, um, I think the one scene that always stick, two scenes that always stick out of my mind, and one of them I mentioned last week in the Sean Connery Happy Birthday episode was, of course, the sniper rifle when he's trying to pay revenge on the one um, guy who um, came onto his property and um, shot him in the arm. And, you know, Bond, you know, what um, Karim Bey does is he's holding the sniper rifle, Bond's letting him use his shoulder to balance it and um, shoot it, shoot him. And, you know, the quote, of course, is, should have kept a mouth shut. And another scene, though, and this is an interesting scene, is the um, the gypsy fight in there. And the biggest thing is, though, that, you know, as they're, you know, sitting down and they're eating and so forth, um, Karim Bey is, um, says that th- there's these two women, they're going to fight over this guy who they both love and and so forth, and they end up getting in this cat fight. And Krempe says, whatever you do, don't say a thing. What, just let things happen and so forth. And Bond has no idea what's about to happen. And of course, what happens is the cat fight and so forth. And it gets pretty crazy. But it's just, you know, just how Krembe is acting and so forth. But, um, you know, overall, Krembe, great ally and so forth. Um, he played a big part in this movie from Russia with Love. And um, it was a shame of, you know, his demise at the very end. But I kind of saw it coming to a point. But that's another story for another day. So let's move into Gold finger um you know one thing pattern that we'll definitely see with at least the sean connery james bonds is felix slider is always there now what's interesting about felix slider is every time he does end up showing or does show back up um he's played by a different actor and i found this interesting just because okay well they never i don't know they always try to keep the same characters like with m and with money penny but for some reason they always change felix sliders I, I have no idea why they did that because like i said jack lord played such a great felix slider so maybe he was busy with hawaii 50 i have not i honestly have no idea now the actor who did play him in this movie was sec linder um once again he's playing the same character he's playing felix slider cia agent um you know he meets up with him in miami um i liked how they introduced him in this because we didn't know who this guy walked up in the suit was with the in the gray suit and the gray hat in Miami um, after the opening sequence and so forth and it, well, you kind of had the idea that this guy was of some importance but make a long story short he walks up to James Bond Bond's laying down getting a massage um, by Dink and um, 
he makes this comment something like um i thought i find you in good hands 007 and then you know this is a typical introduction for a new felix later oh felix um and you almost wanted him to make some of the comments saying oh felix you've changed since the last time i've seen you or something like that and you know it just they end up having that this this felix slider and james bond still have a great rapport and so forth um this one i don't know i think this one was more of a laid back relaxed kind of felix slider um i enjoyed him for in this movie um you know, like I said, it was he was more of kind of a I watching 007 throughout the movie instead of working with him in a way. It felt like, um, you know, he kept in touch with him, but it just you know when say um, James Bond was on Goldfinger's Ranch, well, instead of you know just Felix Slater trying to sneak in and save James Bond, he was kind of just letting him do his own thing. Okay, well, you're a guest in my backyard. Go ahead and do what you got to do, and I'm just going to sit here and just kind of watch in case you need help. If you need help, then you know where to find me and so forth. So that's kind of like the. Um, um, relationship that this Felix Slater had. Like I said, um, he was a great ally, don't get me wrong. Um, but still. Um, another ally, or at least what I would consider an ally, is it's actually Cur- Colonel Smithers, portrayed by Richard Vernon. So Colonel Smithers is at dinner with M and James Bond, and he's giving him the briefing about gold and so forth. What do you know about gold, 007 and so forth? And you, know, you can use this bar of gold. But one of the highlights of this for me is um, at the beginning of the dinner scene, Colonel Smithers says this quote, something like, have a little bit more of this rather disappointing brandy. Yes, I looked this up. Um, what's the matter with it? Um, M says, James Bond, I'd say it's, I'd say it was a 30 year old fine, indifferently blended, sir, with an overdose of Bond Bush. M says, Colonel Smithers is giving lecture 007. And then M smells the brandy and he just kind of gives him that funny look saying, how did he know that? And it's like, exactly. How does James Bond know all this? It's like, you have to believe that James Bond knows a little bit of everything. And it's just, once again, that's that rapport that he had with M. And like I said, M's always amazed by what 007 knows, as is the audience, too. It's like, how would somebody know something like that? But like I said, it's a great scene. Um, one of the better scenes in Goldfinger. Like I said, it doesn't always have to be action. I love when it just, some of the, some of the times these comedic scenes and just, it maybe if it's not intended, it's just like little corpse in there i love um one of the very or actually a very big one that i would consider and it's i i considered him an ally i like to see what everybody else thinks about this i think he's always forgotten at least i always forget the scene is the golf scene in goldfinger the golf scene is amazing because like i said once again it doesn't rely on action it just relies on james bond golf versus goldfinger who's gonna win it, it it can be anybody's game but what makes it interesting is when you know you have the gold the golden bar and you're you're betting that against goldfinger and so forth and james bond really does have a chance of losing this but with a little bit of help from his caddy which you know sometimes if you ever if you were a golfer you understand that sometimes it is good to have a good a good caddy um the caddy's name is hawker who's portrayed by jerry uh jerry dugan and um he had a small part in there but he had a great part Part. And he was a very kind. Of, he was a very funny, interesting character in there, just because he's like, "We've got him now, sir." But it's your honor, sir. And um, James Bond ends up fighting, finding the Slasinger ball that you know, of course, um, Goldfinger was cheating with the actual ball that was in the rough and so forth. And um, um, Hawker makes this comment um, saying. We've got him now, sir. And just, um, it was great. I, I love Hawker. And um, so anytime, you know, you go back and watch Goldfinger, definitely take a look at the caddy in there. But we got to move on here because time is, of course, of the essence. So let's move on to Thunderball. Once again, Felix Slater reprises his role. But no, not as the previous actors. It is played by Rick Van Nutter, um, still playing a CIA agent who's helping James Bond. Um, this Felix Slater was more physical. Um, I love this introduction that they did this Felix Slater because, and I mentioned it on the James Bond, um, on the Sean Connery happy birthday special that I did, but I'm going to mention it real quick again um, because maybe I didn't. Who knows? Anyway, um, so what happens is James Bond is already in Nassau and um, he's sneaking into, he's walking into his apartment, but he realizes that one of the Spectre um, henchmen are there. And um, Felix Slater knocks on the door and James Bond, you know, opens the door and Felix is like, well, hello, double O and then punches him in the gut and then James Bond's like shh and then he turns on the hot water when he gets into the bathroom and the vil- the henchman jumps out of there and so forth but I love this Felix Slater um, you know when I said about the previous Felix Slater and Goldfinger how he was just kind of watching in the back just making sure 007 staying out of trouble and so forth this Felix Slater is a more physical and he's a younger one um, 
I liked what this guy did with his portrayal and so forth. Um, you know, he's flying choppers. He's helping 007 with his diving gear and so forth and whatever else. And um, I, I like, you know, like I said, he was lighthearted. He was serious when he had to be, but he still was kind of like, I don't know. Um, he didn't take himself as seriously as I, I think the one who took himself more seriously was Sean Connery and so forth. He, you know, Felix Slater knew that he had a job to do and so forth. But like I said, he was kind of like more easygoing in a way. Um, so he also had some help in here, too, along with Felix Slater. Um, James Bond also met a contact there in Nassau in the Bahamas. His name was Pinder. Um, he was played by Earl Cameron. Um, like I said, he was kind of an assistant to Felix Slater, American. And, um, you know, he was able, I think I remember him best for when he was able to turn off the lights in uh, Largo's, um, I guess his mansion or whatever you want to say, like on that little island that he was living on. So Bond was trying to sneak on to Largo's estate. And, um, you know, he was telling Pinder, he was asking, kind of demanding a Pinder saying, I, I don't give a damn, just turn off the, all the lights as long as his lights are off and so forth on that island. And that's exactly how Pinder was. You know, he got the job done and it, it was nice. He was a nice little ally to have. I mean, it's always good to have a contact in Nassau, especially when you got to break into the bad guy's estate and so forth. So definitely worth mentioning. Um, let's move on to you only live twice now this i would definitely consider as one of the top allies at least in james bond i know i keep saying that but um tiger tanaka who is played by um tetsuro tamba um he was the head of the japanese secret service and a lot of people would say that you know or at least in the movie they were saying that you know no one knew who this tiger was he was only kind of like secretly known james bond was aware of who he was and so forth M, you know told him your contact in japan is tiger tanaka and it's like oh i didn't really know he existed but okay and tiger is so cool he's really really cool as a matter of fact he has his own little subway system he has his own like private estate with um girls who bathe him and massage him and do all kinds of stuff you know you will take your first civilized bath and um it just you know in just how and this goes back to the 60s you got to remember the time here folks because you know um it's a different time where it wasn't so much women's equal rights if you will be and you could that is specifically shown especially and you only live twice we're saying when tiger makes this comment um in, in japan um Men come first, women come second, something along those lines anyway. And, um, you know, it's just like, well, okay, I mean, I, I can get down with that. Sure, absolutely. If, you're, if you want to have a few honeys bathe me, that's cool. And uh, I'm sure James Bond, Sean Connery didn't mind that at the same time, too. And they're, they're very, he's... Um, he calls him Bond son. I, I love that too. Um, when he's talking to Sean Connery and he's calling him, and instead of J James Bond or 007, he's calling him Bond son. Um, we can't get on the island. You must become Japanese first and something along those lines. But Tiger was probably one of the greatest allies just because, you know, he he took it an ally to a different direction because Tiger is obviously a very physical actor. Um, you know, he can shoot. He's, you know, he's a ninja, as a matter of fact. And he had his whole army of ninjas. Um, when he sneaks into Blofeld's um, underground lair there um, where the rockets were being hidden uh, in the... Um, in the volcano um you know he's you know he's throwing he's using throwing stars he's using machine guns he's fighting people and so forth and um like i said a very physical ally um you know in this movie this is probably one of the first times we really haven't had a felix slider aside from from russia with love um you know compared to creme bay it's comparing apples to oranges but you know if felix slider can't be there and creme bay can't be there then you you get tiger i mean i want tiger on my side as an ally because this guy can kick some serious ass um so another ally and he was he had a very short lifespan to say the least was um deco henderson uh played by charles gray who you also will know as ernst stavro blofeld in diamonds are forever now this is actually charles gray's first appearance um he was a british contact living in japan and he kind of gave 007 right before he met tiger some information about you know how what you know what's going on here saying you know it's not the americans it's not the it's not the russians and so forth it's the japanese and so it, it's somebody in japan and so forth and um I like the, the quote that he had in there when he was um, 
giving James Bond or, um, the the drink. First of all, James Bond, to make sure that it's him, he takes a cane and hits him right on the leg. And James Bond's like, just had to make sure. And he's like, are you satisfied? He's like, very. And then he makes James Bond vodka martini. He's like, that was a uh, shaken, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And, um, you know, and unfortunately he had a quick demise, but, um, you know, the, the, that's the Charles Gray that I did like on there. And when I talked villains, I was saying I didn't like that Charles Gray, um, Blofeld portrayal on there, but I did like this Charles Gray, you know, maybe, and maybe who knows if, you know, they ever redo You Only Live Twice or if they ever decide to bring back this character, maybe we would get, we would get more of him. Um, Let's move on here to On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Of course, we have a new James Bond here. And um, what I said before is, though, you know, while James Bond actors might have changed, M still ch- stayed the same. Bernard Lee was still there. As a matter of fact, you might have seen a little bit more of Bernard Lee. You saw him at the very beginning along with Q. You saw Louis Maxwell's Money Penny in there as well. Um you also had a few new allies, too, and um, this ally is definitely an important one, especially because he's the one who would in- end up introducing James Bond to his future wife. I am talking about Draco, head of the Union course, um, which is pretty much a major crime syndicate and, of course, um, Tracy Bond's white, um, father. Um, you know, I, I really like this guy. He's played by Gabriel Frazetti. Um I love the comment that he had in here. Do not kill me, Mr. Bond, at least not until we've had a drink. And if you wish, I'll give you another chance. And, you know, just how he introduces himself to James Bond and Bond knows exactly who he is. Bond almost throws the knife at him and um, and he didn't throw it at the 13th. He threw it at the 12th or whatever. And he's saying, well, I'm superstitious, something along those lines anyway. But um, Draco was, you know, he was obviously a great ally because he was trying to help um, Bond get to Ernest Alva Blofeld. At the same time, he was trying to like get his personal needs, like saying, okay, I need, I want somebody like you to kind of, I want you to marry my, my daughter. Well, that's an interesting proposition because, you know, okay, here you have information on James Bond's longtime foe, Ernest Stavro Blofeld. At the same time, you want him to marry your daughter? Really? Do you know this is James Bond? You know, so charming, sophisticated secret agent. He doesn't get married. Well, he ended up getting married. But besides the point, though, um, you know how Draco was. And Draco almost seemed like a father figure. So I mean, you know, especially you know with how he was with James Bond. You know, just like when he was at the the horse races, when he was at um, you know, at, at the wedding and so forth. He was trying to give him money and so forth. But it, it, he ended up saying, "Don't worry about it." But um. Another part I really liked is at the very end when Draco was helping Bond go get save Tracy from Blofeld and his lair in the mountains and so forth. And there are three different helicopters in there and the jets threatening to, sh- to um, shoot them down and so forth. And Draco's just, you know, he's this, you know, cocky kind of, you know, um, I mean, yeah, he's probably is technically a bad guy if you want to consider it, but he's also an ally. He's like, go ahead. We're with the such and such service of the Red Cross, whatever it is. And we're on a mission here. And uh, go ahead, shoot us down if you like or whatever. And then you'll cause such a panic and whatever. But I really, really love that, you know, Draco character. And um, I wish we could have gotten more of him. And maybe, like I said, once again, we'll see him in future movies. I'd love to. Um, All right. So uh, let's move in here to Diamonds Are Forever. Um, Once again, Sean Con- Connery is back, and a new Felix Slater is back with this. Um, I won't talk too much about this, but we actually have a new actor on here, Norman Burton, playing CIA agent um, Felix Slater once again. Um, this guy was also, this was the most, I guess, lighthearted of Felix Slater's. Um, more middle age, not, you know, as physical. Um, you know, I liked their exchange that they had at the very beginning at the airport when they were introduced, when they introduced to each other. And um, Felix is like, welcome to Las Vegas, James. Felix Slater, you old fool, you old dog, something like that or whatever. And he's like, all right, James. I know you've hidden the diamonds in the body. Where are they? Elementary, Dr. Leiter. And I like that. I like that. You know, I did like the rapport that they had in here and so forth. And, you know, especially when James was trying to handle Bambi and Thumper. Bambi and Thumper were handling him and so forth. And, um, you know, he's like, oh, do you need help, 007? Oh, no, just a few minutes, something along those lines anyway. So I did like that. An interesting other ally at that same time of Bambi and Thumper was Willard White. Now, Willard White was one of these mysterious characters who Blofeld was it almost like stole his identity and was pretending to be this guy. And we had no idea because he's like this rich, rich hotel owner or casino owner in Las Vegas. And you would expect him to be like this really powerful looking guy and so forth. And 
with all due respect to the character or to the actor who played him, I would have never guessed that it was going to be this guy. And it ended up being actor Jimmy Dean. Now, in my mind, when I think Jimmy Dean, of course, I think of breakfast. I think of breakfast sausages and so forth. So I didn't realize there was an actor named Jimmy Dean. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not trying to be funny here, but it just you know that's how I, that's how I knew this guy. But um, and Jimmy Dean, you know, he played Willard White. You know, is he was definitely comic relief in this movie, especially when they showed him. Is that is that guy? Is that um, Bert Saxby or whatever, um, tell him he's fired. And then Bond shoots him and so forth or whatever, and he falls down the cliff and so forth. And um, um, when he first meets 007, um, and he's like, are you Willard White? And he's like, FBI, CIA, and um, actually uh, British intelligence. What the hell is going on here? Do you know what they've done to me? They've locked me in this. I see you friend, my, met my friends Bambi and Thumper. And once again, like I said, it, this is, you know, I've always said this about Diamonds Are Forever. It doesn't take itself too seriously, or at least I find it. It's not one of my favorite James Bond movies, but it definitely had some good comedy elements in there. Jimmy Dean was, you know, he was very entertaining to say the least and so forth. So let's move into Live and Let Die. All right. One, um, Bernard Lee is back as M. Um, Louise Maxwell is back as Money Penny. There is no Q in this, so um, you know we have to do with we. This is the first James Bond where we haven't had a Q. Um, we've he's spoken of. Um, here's your watch from Q and so forth, and it's given to him by Money Penny. Um, Felix Leiter is back once again, and of course played by a different character. Um, he's actually played by David Hedison. Um, and we don't actually get to meet up with Felix Slater until James Bond comes into New York. And um, let me just say that David Hedison portray. When I think Felix Slater, sure I think of Jack Lord, but I there's something about David Hedison's character um, uh, that I love. I I don't know why, but what you know, he's probably my top Felix Slater. Um, you know, just how. You know, we've talked about how James Bond takes himself very seriously. Roger Moore, you know, of course, does take himself seriously when he needs to and so forth. But he's just, you know, that kind of a uh, more easygoing James Bond. Well, if he's easygoing, then I don't know how to describe David Hudson because David Hudson's VX Slider is just like, oh, don't worry, James. We, we've got a, you know, we've got this taken care of when they're in New Orleans, even when they go into the bar. Um, James Bond, you know, orders the drink bourbon. No ice, please. Felix says two uh, Sazeracs. Where's your sense of adventure, James? This is New Orleans. Relax. And just shows you how, like, you know, they're both secret agents, but they just go into the, they just go in there. And of course, you, who's the more serious one this time? It's kind of flip flop. It's actually Roger Moore's James Bond that's actually more serious, which I thought was really interesting. Um, David Hedison does come back as Felix Slater, which is a first for Felix Slater, but we'll talk about that in a few. So let's move on to one if, you know, we've had comic relief, and I know I say Diamonds Are Forever is more comedy. Well, Live and Let Die took it to the next step when they had this character. His name is Sheriff J.W. Pepper. He needs no introduction. Um, you know, he is the... <sighs> Well, we've had James Bond in the United States before, and we've had him deal with American you know, Americans before, American law enforcement. We kind of had a touch of that in Diamonds Are Forever. But when you introduced Sheriff J.W. Pepper back in 1973, I can only imagine what was going through the crowd's mind when they first saw this character. I, I really love Sheriff J.W. Pepper. I think it's just because he, how he's just, you know... Um, how he's portrayed by actor Clifton James. He is the Louisiana sheriff. He is um, very outspoken, to say the least. Um, one of the best comments he made is, What are you, some kind of doomsday machine, boy? And just, you kind of get where I'm going with that. You know, ten fingers, boy, and stuff like that. And, um, you know, just how just how he is, the boat chase, and how J Sheriff J.W. Pepper is trying to stay, in, you know, on the tail of 007, on the tail of the bad guy, Kananga's men there, and so forth. And my 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 cousin Billy Bob, he's got the fastest boat around. You get Billy Bob, tell him Billy Bob, you know, and he'll he'll get him. Don't worry. And um, you know, just uh, I I love that, and especially when the um, the trooper explains, like I said, to Sheriff J W Pepper, saying. 
JW, this guy, he's a British secret agent from, he's a secret, he's a secret agent from Britain. A secret agent on whose side? And I, I just love it. I can't get enough of him. And he was loved so much, in fact, that he actually did a return in The Man with the Golden Gun. So, um, yeah, before I move into The Man with the Golden Gun, I gotta say that there was another, um, ally in here, Coro Jr. You remember the name Coro? Cause he was all the way back in Dr. No. This is Coro Jr. Um, he is the son of Coro, of course, from Doctor No, hence Coro Junior. Um, he did have a big, ro- he did have a big part at the end on here because he was actually helping once again Felix Slater and James Bond. Um, he put the landmines in the poppy fields, um, where the heroin was in um, Kananga's uh, estate, and um, ended up blowing it up and so forth. And you know, he ran a charter boat once again, just like his dad. But the, and like his dad, he ended up surviving through it and so forth. Um, so moving into the man with the golden gun. Um, this is the first appearance of Q in the Roger Moore Bond films. Um, you know, it's nice to have Q back, of course. He didn't really supply him with many gadgets, I would say. I would say that, you know, there's the third nipple thing, of course, which is, I don't know if I would quite call that a gadget. Um, but, you know, he still has that same relationship with James Bond saying, you know, I don't, uh, James Bond, you, I know who you are. You just don't, you know, all you want to do is just kid around. You're just a playboy and you just want to mess with my gadgets never return them and so forth so once again nice to see q back we also see the return of sheriff jw pepper um he actually is more of an ally this time with 007 because he's trying to help um chase um the man with the golden gun um scaramanga in a car chase in um i believe it was in hong kong and um make a long story short they're on this car chase and it goes out and where you know Bond's on one side of the road, Scaramanga's on the other side of the road with Nick Knack, and um, Sheriff J.W. Pepper's like, come on, gain on him, boy. And then, you know, they, they stop and they see a bridge, but the problem is that the bridge is, you know, broken in the middle. Um, so how does James Bond intend to do this? And Sher- even Sheriff J.W. Pepper is just like, you're not gonna... And this is classic Roger Moore. You bet I am, boy. And just it gives it right back to Sheriff J.W. Pepper. And it is hilarious. And they flip the car onto the other side of the bridge. And how that works, I have no idea. Regardless, though, J.W. Pepper loved it and so forth. And saying, you know, I, I'm law enforcement. And, you know, you need to listen to me and so forth, boy. And, um, you know, like I said, remember the time that this was happening and so forth. But, like I said, great character. So that was the end of Sher- Sheriff J.W. Pepper. Pepper, but like I said, great ally and a fun ally at, at, at the most. Let's move into the spy who loved me. Um, you know, when we saw this, this was obviously more of a change into the classic elements of James Bond. But remember, this was happening at the time of the Cold War. So USA versus Russia, folks. That's exactly what was going on. And they did address this, as a matter of fact, in here. Um, now, not from the USA side, but, you know, of Britain, where they were kind of in the middle, um, and you know Russia wasn't quite their ally. Also, it was always it was you know they didn't say it so much USA versus Russia. It was also Britain versus Russia too, um, or USSR, whatever you want to call it, Soviet Union. There you go. And you know we actually see some more characters from the Soviet Union, which we've never really seen before. Um, there's an introduction of a character named General Gogol, who's played by War- Walter G- Gattel, and he's actually portrayed all the way up until The Living Daylights as General Gogol. Um, I love General Gogol. I don't know why. I know that he's on the Russian side and, you know, whatever. Um, General Gogol is, you know, he is the com- he is the opposite number um, of M. You know, he's exactly what um, M is to you know, MI6, but he is to the KGB and so forth. Um, Gogol is sneaky. Gogol is, you know, yeah, he could be classified as a bad guy too, as of what he's doing. But some, you know, but in and most of the time, he actually is good. Um, you know, like they were trying to re- leave or retrieve the microfilm, and James Bond is, you know. He sneaks into, or he goes into the um, secret, um, the secret layer that MI6 had. Then Bond walks in, expecting to see M, and then you, ke- then all of a sudden, just gives this oh my deer in headlights look, and ends up being General Google. You kill, cue the Marvin Hamlish Russian music, and then there's General Google sitting there. It's like, 
um, you're not supposed to be here. You are Russian. You are KGB. Um, on any other given Sunday, I would have my wall there, and I would probably be pointing it at you. Well, not in the case because M is right there too. And well, M explains that you know they're going to be working um directly with the KGB in order to get to Stromberg and try to get all this figured out and sorted out. So, um, you know, it's really, I mean, historically for Russia and Britain to work together, it's really interesting to see this because, um, you know, I wonder if something like this was happening at the time. But the fact that, you know, James Bond does keep up with history of, you know, Russians working with Brit, the Brits in the USA working with and so forth or whatever. Um, you also have an introduction at the very beginning when they're explaining about the stolen submarine of Frederick Gray. He is the British Prime Minister of Defense. Um, he is portrayed by Jeffrey Keane. Um, he is going to be seen throughout um, the entire the rest of the Roger Moore James Bond movies. Um, I liked him. He was always shown at M, and um, he was always referred to as Prime Minister. And um, you know, M would always introduce him, and he's like, mm, like that. I, that's his famous thing. He's like, mm, well, get cracking, 007. Mm. And I almost want to do a recording of that just so, you know, so I can have that on a soundboard or something like that. Mm, like that. And, um, you know, I like Frederick Gray. I like seeing British Prime Minister of Defense. It was like you can't have Roger Moore um, and briefing now without the Frederick Gray, British Prime Minister of Defense. But I did like him. Um, another um, future M that you did see in here was I definitely wanted to mention was Vice Admiral Hargraves. Um, he is the flag officer of submarines of Royal Navy. Um, he's played by Robert Brown. Robert Brown ends up playing M in Octopussy right after Bernard Lee stepped down um, and passed away. Um, rest in peace. Um, he was playing M in Octopussy, A View to a Kill, Living Daylights, and License to Kill. Um, you know, it, while we're already on the subject of this M, um, you know, I liked his M, but I would say that I, you could definitely tell a change that, you know, he was kind of filling the shoes. He, it's almost like he tried to be Bernard Lee to a point, but he couldn't be. Um, you know, I, like I said, I loved Bernard Lee as M. Um, he would be Robert Brown, you know, I know he had big shoes to fill and so forth but he'd probably be a, out of all the m's he would probably be my least favorite i'm not saying that's a bad thing i'm just saying that he was he was okay um we'll talk about license to kill in a minute because i he actually had more of an interesting role in that um let's hop into moonraker um you know it was interesting pe- for this because at the very beginning and majority of the movie this guy was a villain then all of a sudden he turned ally and yeah i'm talking about jaws um you know when they're in space the space station excuse me um drax is saying you know jaws kill them you you obey me and then you know james bond it kind of like says you know um shows jaws saying hey you know you have all the most beautiful people all most perfected people and anybody who doesn't you know fit your standards what happens to them they're gonna die right and then a curse of jaws like oh light bulb um drax is gonna betray me and uh he's gonna kill me and you know what i'm gonna change sides here and i'm gonna join 007 the one guy that i've been trying to kill for all this time since 1977 so it was really interesting seeing Jaws be the good guy. I remember, um, I think it was director Lewis Gilbert said, you know, everybody wanted to see this happen. So he kind of did this and um, it, it's okay. It's all right. And seeing Jaws turn, I, I like seeing Jaws more as a bad guy, but, you know, it was kind of cool seeing him at the, at the very end, finally speaking and opening the champagne bottle with his girlfriend saying, well, here's to us and so forth. Um you know, there was Colonel Scott, who's played by Michael Marshall in there. He's the um, one of the U.S. Space Marines commanders who were in there. Um, definitely wanted to mention him. He didn't have that big of a role in there, but, you know, it. he did help James Bond get out of the space station. Probably if it wasn't for him and Jaws, then James Bond would be uh, floating around in space and so forth. So let's move on to For Your Eyes Only. Um, you know, right before Robert Brown did take over as M, this was at a time where Bernard Lee had, you know, ended up, due to health, he ended up stepping down as M. So they ended up not replacing M just yet, but they did have somebody standing in his place and they did explain it, saying, you know, due to health reasons, um, we have MI6 Chief of Staff Bill Tanner. And this is a, Tanner is a very important character because he's, uh, seen in future Bond films. And, you know, at this time, he's portrayed portrayed by James Villiers. Um, he's portrayed by James Villiers. And I, I liked Bill Tanner. I mean, I really like the character of Bill Tanner. This Bill Tanner is more kind of a, I would classify him as a stuffy, um, stuffy kind of suited, um, I don't know. I, I, can't, I don't want to use bad language on here, but he's, 
Yeah, I'll say it. I, he's kind of kind of like a stick up his ass and so forth, how he talks and so forth. But, um, you know, he meant well. And, you know, he wasn't trying to be M, but he was just saying, you know, I'm taking over for M temporarily while he's, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, he's like, on 007, try not to muck it up this time. And I was like, okay, dude, you know, do you know who you're talking to? This is James Bond. He saves the world all the time. But, you know, still seeing Bill Tanner, it was a kind of an interesting change. Um, but I did like it. Um, a very big ally for James Bond in this movie was Milos Colombo. Now, he was played by Topol. Um, what was interesting about Colombo is that, you know, here you have the bad guy tricking, you know, James Bond and saying, oh, well, you know what? Um, Cristados is saying that, oh, it's Colombo. He's the bad guy. You know, he's the one who's doing all the smuggling. He's the one who's doing all the stuff. He's got the ATAC tracking system and so forth. Well, it actually wasn't. It was actually Cristados and, you know, who's tricking him in Colombo ends up i don't want to say he kidnaps james bond but after um countess lizzle dies on the beach and so forth um colombo has his men and he actually his men actually do save 007 from Locke, and they put they bring him onto the sailboat and um colombo you know actually you know is talking to james bond saying i'm a good judge of man and you have what the greeks call thrazos guts and um you know he gives them the walter ppk back and you know they end up saying okay it's not me you're after everything that christados has told you is actually about himself but i'm still after all this after everything that you've done i'm still going to help you and so forth and i really like that i liked christados character something about him is chewing his pistachios always cracks me up but it did end up working out because when they snuck into christados or lock some little i guess um his storage facility there where um you know they had the shootout and so forth the pistachios actually came in handy but i really liked colombo and he still ends up getting back at cristados because they used to be partners at one time and you know colombo ends up saving james bond by throwing the knife in cristados back and so forth spoiler alert um one ally that didn't you know had a very short lifespan fortunately was um luigi ferrara um he was portrayed by john moreno he was the mi6 or the italian mx6 agent in um contact when um james bond was at the ski resort and so forth um Luigi did, had a very minor role. He did introduce him to Christados. Um, I did like how um, when James Bond was going to um, visit BB, he um, um, he makes this comment to uh, Ferrara. He's like, "And Luigi, whatever you do, don't press any of the buttons on this car." And Luigi was he was a really sweet guy, as a matter of fact, and I really liked him. And he meant well and so forth. He was kind of he looked shady at the very beginning because you thought he was following James Bond, which he was. But he you know it just he was kind of quirky. But he was kind of he was a sweet guy, and I. I didn't like seeing him die in that movie. He was strangled, but um, it was you know d definitely worth mentioning. Anyway, all right, let's move into Octopussy. Um, this is where Robert Brown does finally come to come in as M, the new head of the British Secret Service. They really don't do any special introduction for this. It's just like okay, here's Robert Brown. You know. 007 walks into the office um, in MI6, and, you know, the, the uh, Minister of Defense is there, M is just there, and smoking his pipe also, and it's just like, okay, well, we don't know any backstory about him, but here's your new M, and just accept it. It's like, okay, well, you know, I can get in touch with him. Like I said, not my favorite M, but, you know, he was he was good, but like I said, it was tough to fill the shoes of Bernard Lee, but it, it's hard for anybody to do that. Um, you know, backing up here a little bit before actually um, James Bond walks into the office, you know, it, he does his typical thing of throwing the hat onto the um, coat hanger and so forth, and then he looks over and he sees a younger um, um, secretary there, and, and he's like, Money Penny, you are looking younger than ever, and so forth. And then ends up being not Money Penny, but Money Penny's new assistant and so forth, um, Miss Penelope Smallbone, portrayed by um, Michaela Clavel, I think that's how you pronounce it. And Money Penny is still there. And, you know, it's um, it's almost like it was set up in a way, but they decided to go that route as saying this might be kind of the Miss Smallbone might be the new money penny you're taking over and so forth. And they they realized, you know, at least it was probably the writer's way of saying, hey, we know money penny is not is not getting any older. At the same time, she's still money penny. You still got to admire her. And, um, you know, it just you got to love her. And um, I liked how James Bond gave, you know, money penny one rose and he gave the rest of the flowers to miss smallbone and miss smallbone you know when she walk or bond walks into the office to meet M, he just gives she gives him that <sighs> that sigh and so does money penny and I, I love that so definitely worth mentioning i'm it's a shame we didn't get more of miss smallbone but 
anyway, um, one really big asset that James or ally that James Bond did have was VJ, and VJ was the um, main ally in India, and um, so was um, Sad Rudin, um, who was played by Albert Moses, and actually VJ is played by VJ um, Armitrage. I think that's how you say his name. Um, both of them are great allies. VJ was just kind of like, he was a very easygoing kind of guy, um, especially when I liked how they introduced him because he's this guy, he's playing this flute, and he's, you know, of course has the King Cobra, and he's like, he's playing this, you know, song on there, and then he's like, That's my best flute that I can do. And it's and Bond gives him this look. He's like, that's a fine tune you have there. And um, it just uh, everything that, you know, the, the chase that they had in there when they were on, like, I guess the scoot. I don't want to call it what it's a scooter of, of some sorts anyway. But the chase that they had, VJ has his tennis racket in there and so forth. And he's like, they have that. It's, you know, it's typical Roger Moore. But, you know, he's hitting the one guy and the crowd looks one way. And he's hitting the bad guy the other way, and the crowd looks the other way. I love that scene in there. And, you know, his, um, his little, I guess we'll call it the scooter, ends up, you know, having super super speed on it and, you know, kind of goes on two wheels and stuff like that, I guess, or the back two wheels anyway. But um, I really liked VJ. It's a shame that he did um, die in there. Um, Sad Rudin was a good um, ally in there, too. More of the serious um kind of guy very friendly kind of guy and he set james bond up at the hotel and so forth and you know um like i said he was had a smaller part i think vj definitely stole the show in that but i did like him let's move on here to a view to a kill um you know when we're talking allies this is one you know especially in view to a kill i think that always gets forgotten sir godfrey tibbet um you know when i first watched james bond films you know this is one of the first james bond roger moore films that i ever watched he's played by patrick mackney um you know he's actually a horse trainer and who helps james bond infiltrate zorin's chateau and stables and so forth whatever and he's like i you know i don't know you know how zorin's doing this getting his horses to go faster and so forth but you know he agrees to help james bond he ends up acting as his chauffeur which i thought was really funny and the relationship that him and bond or roger moore and him have in this it's i mean i think i don't know if it was you know how um sir godfrey Tippett was able to hold a straight face when james bond's talking to him so godfrey you know look at my suit it's all wrinkled and so forth dear god Tippett, what is this and um you know i just love that scene when they're unpacking all the bags and so forth and here let me help you tip it and he grabs the umbrella oh well thank you sir and um just all that he's like do we have to keep this up and he's like oh it just for it's just you know it's part of the role there tip it that's how that's how i roll because i'm james bond and then you know stacy sutton rolls in on the helicopter meets max soren and so forth and you know um Bond, of course, is being Bond, the old devil that he is, saying, you know, um, she might be close for inspection. And uh, Tibbet makes the quote on there saying, James, we're on a mission. And Roger Moore, in his typical Roger Moore, James Bond line, says, Sir Godfrey, when on a mission, I am expected to sacrifice myself. And Tibbet just is like, oh, my God, who, what, what is, who is this guy? Really? You're making me work with him? I'm a horse trainer, for God's sakes. But, you know, I love Tibbet, Tibbet. Um, you know, it's a shame once again that he died. Um, but unfortunately it's just a pattern of being an ally of a superhero or secret agent that, you know, you either have, you usually have a very short lifespan in a Bond movie and so forth. As did this other contact here, um, Chuck Lee, CIA, played by David Yip. Um, he assists Bond and Stacey Sutton when they're in San Francisco. Um, we don't get too much backstory on him, just kind of like he's there. He's helping 007 with what he needs and so forth. But, um, you know, I, I always knew him as the, um, the, the guy from indiana jones and the temple of doom but i did like seeing him in this um you know it's interesting because you have a cia contact but however it is not felix slater it's like okay well where is felix slater in this maybe they were trying to do something else um you know there wasn't like there was any certain incident with a shark that had happened to um felix slater but maybe they were just trying something new so Moving on here to The Living Daylights. Well, you know, Felix Slater, you know, might not have been in that movie, but when you get a new James Bond, it's like you almost always have to introduce Felix Slater all over again. Felix Slater is back and is played by actor John Terry. Um, he's He doesn't get that big of a role, actually, in this, and it's not until, like, the later half of the film where we actually do see him. He's on the boat. He's doing... This Felix Slater is not so much being action-oriented. He's more doing surveillance and giving Bond more some briefing and kind of intelligence and so forth. Um... 
he's okay. You know, if I was to say who was my fa- my least favorite Felix Leiter, it would be it's something about John Terry that just I don't know. It's just he was okay. He was just like. I don't know. I just, I guess I just wanted, it, you know, maybe that I just wanted to see other Felix, a certain other Felix Slider come back and maybe I do get my wish to come true. Um, you know, I just, it's nothing against the actor. It was just, okay, maybe it was just how his part was written. It was just maybe an afterthought. Okay, well, you know, let's throw Felix Slider in here because, you know, it's something we have to do with every new James Bond. He always has to have a Felix Slider. I have no idea. Um, one ally that I really liked in here, and he was, we were unsure if he was the ally, was General uh, Pushkin, and he's portrayed by Jonathan, Jonathan Rice Davies. Um, he is the new head of the KGB. He's actually replacing General Gogol. Once again, like I said about the Cold War, um, we're still seeing signs of that because it is 1987, c- kind of near in the end of it and so forth, but... Um, you know, I liked General Pushkin, um, and not just because he was solid in the Indiana Jones movies. Yes, that's what I always knew him for. So when I saw him in this, I'm like, it's Sala, it's Sala. Wait, what is he? Who is he playing? He's the head of the KGB. How the how the hell is that possible? Um, you know, when Timothy Dalton is on screen, we all know that Timothy Dalton plays a very serious James Bond. When he shows up in Pushkin's hotel room and, you know, his mistress, whatever you want to call her, um, his girlfriend, his wife, I'm not exactly sure who she was, but, um, you know, he, you know, his um holding her hostage at the time he sneaks behind the door and there is Timothy Dalton with his oversized silencer compressor on there and, um, and he's like, um, he throws Pushkin on the bed and he says, I take it this is not a social call, 007. And he's like, yes, you should have brought lilies. And, um, just the react, just how they had this, it just like how serious Timothy Dalton was, of course, one, and how, um, General Pushkin was saying, you know, what, what are you doing here? I know, James Bond, I know who you are and you're a professional and you can't just kill without, you know, having a reason and so forth. But, you know, Timothy Dalton with the evidence that he has saying two of our agents are dead and so forth and um you know he has some what this is really what i thought was going to be the end of general pushkin just how dalton has him get down on his knees and cross his legs and cross his arms and so forth it's like oh wow he's really gonna do this we've never seen quite a kill like this before um you know i mean not probably since dr no like even as james bond kind of just like kind of snuck or just kind of killed somebody like this at least in my mind anyway but pushkin ends up being a great ally they fake his death and so forth and um he ends up you know giving immunity to the um bond girl in there but um Moving on here, another ally that shows up at the very end is Cameron Shaw. He's played by Art Malik. He's a leader of this Afghan rebels in a way. I guess I would call them, in in a sense, um, they're they're kind of bad guys to a point. I don't know. I, I they're rebels. Bottom line, and you know James Bond, you know, ends up saying, "Hey, I need you guys to help me break onto this Russian base, and uh, and you know we need to get to this these Russian um." officers and so forth and you know shaw's like you're nuts i'm not going to help you i mean i'll get you to this point a but you got to get to point b on your own and so forth but ends up shaw ends up coming in to save uh timothy dalton's ass and ends up being great um you know let's see moving on here let's go into license to kill um you know when i said that you know a certain felix Slater would show up eventually yeah i'm talking about mr david hessen I liked seeing David Hedison show back up as Felix Slater, and we got to see even more Felix Slater. Now, the problem with this was that Felix Slater, um, well, I'm jumping ahead of myself. One, I liked at at the very beginning, very from the pre-title sequence, is that where is James Bond, you know, and Felix Slater on their way to? Well, they're on a mission, yeah, but they're on a mission to make sure Felix Slater gets to his wedding day on time. And, you know, there's another character there named Shark who's portrayed by Frank McRae. Um, he's a friend of Felix Slater and owns a boat and owns a boat charter business also in the um in the Florida Keys, and all three of them in there, um, tuxes and so forth. And what ends up happening is, um, if you haven't seen License to Kill, I'm spoiling it right now for you, but it's okay. It's only the pre-title sequence. But for all of you other um, listeners out there that have seen this movie, you know where I'm going with this. The scene where the um, Coast Guard chopper ends up showing up next to the limousine, follow me, and then, you know, Lighter's like, associates of mine from the DEA, and then, you know, Lighter's like, what the hell is this, after the chopper lands, and they're like, we know where Sanchez is, have you got it cleared by Nassau, yes, we've had the green light, and then, you know, you see Lighter run, and Pond is like, uh, Felix, haven't you forgotten something, it's your wedding day. 
Later, it's like, you go tell Della. And Bond's like, no way. I'm not telling Della. You can go tell Della. And it's like, I'm coming with you. And then he, then Sharky ends up being the one to tell um, Della that, you know, um, Felix is going to be a little late because he's trying to catch a drug dealer. And, you know, Bond you know, goes with Lighter. And I, I love this scene also when they're on the scene, uh, when they're on the chopper, um, Felix Lighter hands Bond the gun and the Taurus, um, nine millimeter or whatever it is. And <laughs> Felix Lighter makes the comment saying, James, just in case and then bond's like ch, ch, i got you that kind of deal he didn't make that comment i'm just saying though it's just kind of that attitude that you know okay let's go into action felix let's go kick some ass and um you know just the you know this just shows you know even when they you know they parachute after they catch sanchez into the chap over to the chapel and so forth just saying this is the best relationship we've ever seen with felix slider and james bond with this, it's just like, okay, they're best friends. James Bond is Felix Slater's best man at the wedding. It just shows you like how much they go into it. And even Felix knows to the extent saying, okay, um, when they give him the wedding gift, the lighter and so forth. And, um, or even when Della throws the, um, garter to James Bond, it's like, James, you know what this means when you catch this? And James is like, no, sorry. And, um, Della's like, would I say something? And Felix explains he was married once, but it was a long time ago and so forth. Like I said, I like seeing that history in there, especially, you know, I knew Michael G. Wilson had a hand in that and he's even had a hand in Free Your Eyes Only of kind of throwing that in with Tracy Bond or whatever. But I like knowing that sometimes these, all these Bond stories are connected in a way. So, you know, even for Felix later to know what happened with James Bond, just like, ah, okay. He's, you really are his best friend. Unfortunately though, Felix later is caught by Sanchez. His wife has ended up murdered, but, um, and I know I'm spending a lot of time with this Felix later just because I love this character so much. Um, you know, when they're, um, he's caught by Sanchez and he's fed to the shark. First of all, one of the bloodiest scenes I've ever seen in a James Bond movie, even to this day. And that was back in 1989. And, you know, Sanchez is so ruthless to saying today, um, I want you to know this is nothing personal. It's strictly business. And today is the first day of the rest of your life. And Felix Slider or David Hessen portrayed this so well. And I mean, I don't know how you could portray a shark biting off your legs, you know, any better, but he's like, I'll see you in hell. And just that look that, that his eyes are popping out of his head and so forth. And it just, at the very end though, you know, Felix Slater's like, Oh, hi James. You know, um, I think I might have a job for you and so forth at the very end. Um, I did like that. Um, some other allies worth mentioning in here. Once again, when we're talking the DEA, it's, um, DEA agent, it's DEA agent Hawkins, um, played by Grand L. Bush. Um, you know, I liked in, what he d- did in here because he was, you know, he knew who James Bond was. He knew what was going on, that Bond was investigating what had happened to Felix later and so forth. And it's like, hey, you need to stay away with it. Stay away from it. This is not your turf. Well, what ends up happening is that Hawkins leads him to the Hemingway house. And who ends up being at the Hemingway house? But MI6 agents and M, Robert Brown's M. And this is what I, this, if I, there was any time that I really love Robert um, Brown M, it was this time when they're in the Hemingway house. And when he was holding the cat, I was like, it can't be Blofeld. No, it wasn't Blofeld. It was him, obviously. But what I liked about this was that, um, you know, how M was being so cold hearted with James Bond, especially like this. I mean, we've seen him be cold hearted, but this was of all time saying, Leda knew the risk. Rubbish. Uh, don't spare me the sentimental rubbish, 007. We own a country club. That kind of deal. God be with you, Commander. And, um, you know, that, that kind of, um, that whole, um, relationship that he had with bond just like okay fine you want to go after this you can do it or whatever but um you know you're no longer going to be with mi6 you're pretty much like give me your, your turn over your weapon right now and so forth and um i really really like that relationship they had anyway all right so i know i'm running short on time here and i haven't even gotten to you know the other half of the james bond you know allies and so forth i'm gonna pause it there kind of like i did with villains now let's move into some batman okay let's let's change let's shift gears here let's go into batman 1989 all right alfred pennyworth if there was any bigger ally for batman how or bruce wayne how can you not say alfred alfred pennyworth and especially this alfred pennyworth michael portrayed by malcolm actor michael golf um you know he is like the great he's like the grandfather like the sweet you know gentle loving grandfather he's there to assist and you know he's not a physical guy he's just he's an older butler he's kind of almost like a frail man or whatever but with a very sense you know very nice sense of humor and so forth and um 
I loved him. I, I love this Alfred. And, you know, I always say that, you know, this is my Batman and this is my first Alfred. It really is. And I love this Alfred. I I truly, truly do. Um, everything that he was, you know, with Bruce Wayne, just, you know, helping him out with the bat suit, helping him out around the house and so forth or whatever. But he would always make those, you know, kind of quotes and, you know, that just would say, you know, you need to watch yourself there, Bruce, because, um, you know, and here this quote will sum it up the best. I have no wish to fill my few remaining years grieving for the loss of old friends or their sons. And that's kind of like Alfred saying, okay, uh, Bruce, you need to be careful, you know, in a way, you know, um, you know, I've cared for, you know, I cared for your family and I'm caring for you and I don't want to lose you in the same way that your parents were lost, just like how they were killed by the Joker or, or Jack Napier. But, um, you know, I just like, I think one of the funniest parts I believe was, um, they're at the Bruce Wayne party, um, whatever charity event was, and it's the first crossing between um, Vicky Vale and Bruce Wayne. Well, actually, it's the first time we actually see Michael Keaton's Bruce Wayne, and it, you just see this butler in here, and you just think he's just like a waiter. You think he, he's just carrying champagne, just this older guy. Well, it ends up being Alfred, of all people, but... Um, you know, Bruce Wayne, he's following Bruce Wayne around after Bruce Wayne signs this um, whatever paperwork it was. And Bruce Wayne is being typical Bruce Wayne. And he just takes the pen and he's like just kind of sticks it right into the plant or into some kind of fake plant or whatever. And what does Alfred do? Well, he just he quickly goes right behind him, picks it up. Um, Bruce Wayne is drinking some champagne, puts the glass down on a table. And what does Alfred do? Picks it up really quickly and so forth. Um, how he told the stories to Vicky Vale at dinner and so forth. And there was young Master Bruce. Da, 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 da. And I, I loved that this guy is just like, it's like the sweet grandfather that you always wanted. And, um, you know, I love this Alfred. I can't keep saying it enough. So, um, you know, he was there all the way up until... Batman and Robin and so forth and you know even if we don't get to it tonight I'll I'll keep mentioning Alfred here and there and so forth um another big ally and he's an ally but in compared to the new how they're portraying him now um it's a little different so you have commissioner gordon okay um portrayed by pat hingle um you know got to love pat hingle because you know like i said he's he's a classic more of a classic kind of a commissioner gordon um you know he's not quite as um like a physical kind of, you know, get into the action and so forth. He's there, but he's also more like a commissioner, not like doing all the shootouts and so forth, but he does, he gets on the bullhorn. This is commissioner Gordon. Oh, and I'm taking alive and so forth. That kind of deal. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's aware of, you know, that there's Batman out there while he might not want to admit it. Um, you know, he knows, he doesn't know if he can trust Batman yet. You know, at the very end, at the very end, um, you know, after, you know, realizing, you know, maybe Batman is here to help because, you know, he's helping, trying to help us take down the Joker and so forth. Maybe he's friend or foe, but I think he's friend. Um, you know, Batman ends up, you know, kill, you know, the Joker dies. If you want to say he killed him, whatever, you know, technically, I guess you could say he did or maybe you're just kind of slipped and fell, whatever. Make a long story short, though, um, they're at the very end. And of course, oh, yeah, Billy D. Williams is in here. Yeah, Billy D. Williams, Lando Carizian is playing Harvey Dent. How about that? Um, you know, at the time, I never realized one that it was, you know, Lando because I never watched Star Wars yet. Um, so of in a sense, he was always Harvey Dent to me, but I didn't realize that he was actually that Harvey Dent. Yeah, the Harvey Dent that eventually would go on to play Two Face. Now, you gotta love Billy D. Williams because he's this very, very slick character. Um, you know, even from the very beginning of the, of, um, the movie in Batman '89, he's just like citizens of Gotham. I'm a man of few words. But those words will count, and so will my actions, and so forth. Um, yeah, I can remember that somehow, some way, just because I'll probably watch that movie one too many times. Though, um, you know, you don't get to see too much. Harvey Dent is there. He's there as the new district attorney in the background and so forth. And yeah, he's trying to take down um, Napier and, you know, Carl Grissom's bad guys, you know, all the bad guys and so forth. He's not sure what to make of Batman. Um, you know, as he says, we have more things to worry about than ghosts and goblins and stuff like that. It's those little comments and stuff like that I love. Um, but what I'm leading up to is the very end is, you know, after they realize, okay, Batman is, you know, he's a good guy. He's here to help us. He's here to help Gotham City. So, He's reading, um, Harvey Dent's reading this letter and, you know, after, um, 
after the choker died and so forth. And, um, you know, he's saying, you know, citizens of Gotham, you know, whenever, if you ever are in need, such and such, you know, call me. And of course you have Alexander Knox, which could technically be considered an ally. He says, question, how do we call him? And then you have commissioner Gordon walk over and there's the signal, the classic Batman signal. He gave us a signal. That's my best Danny Elfman. There you go. I'm here all night. Anyway, um, you know, that's just, and it leads into one of my favorite scenes where Batman's looking at his own signal, which we've seen many times, but it's just Michael Keaton looking at his Batman signal, which I love. Um, you know, and there's going to be so many things that can be said about Commissioner Gordon and, you know, even Harvey Dent and so forth. But I guess looking over it with this, the biggest ally is still, you know, Alfred. And um, you got to love him when he return and when he comes back. When you yeah, see what I did there, transition, how he came back and Batman returns. We get to see even more Alfred in here. Um, you know, the relationship between him and Michael Keaton is still um, it's still hilarious at times, um, you know. The comment is um, made um, when they're watching the Penguin on TV and uh, Oswald Cobblepot is trying to, of course, run for mayor and so forth. And Alfred makes this comment saying, our prime concern is this ghastly grotesque. But let's not forget about repairing the Batmobile. That's security to consider. And somebody reminded me online about this also. Um, Shout out to uh, 007, I Only Need One. Um, they they reminded me of the quote in there by Bruce Wayne, who led Vicky Vale into the Batcave. I'm just sitting there working, and there she is, it's like, "Hi, Vic, come on in." And it's just you know, just like Bruce Wayne saying, "Oh yeah, you know, I might have kind of you know wrecked the Batmobile, but guess who led Vicky Vale into the Batcave there, Alfred? Yeah, you messed that one up, buddy. Way to go!" But it's just you know, they have that fun you know relationship rapport and so forth. But I gotta love that. I love it. Um, Commissioner Gordon did return. Um, you have a new mayor in here the only reason i mention him is just because you know you, we didn't you saw the mayor before in the um previous batman 1989 this one has a bigger a slightly bigger role because he's dealing with max shrek and we all know how any christopher walken villain can be yeah view to a kill and so forth um so let's move into batman forever um you know alfred is back same alfred played by michael golf um Commissioner Gordon, also the same character, or same actor, Pat Hingle was back. This time you do have a, a bigger ally, um, and you know this is the time now where Batman actually finally gets a partner. Um, well, it leads into him getting a partner. He, we are introduced to Dick Grayson, um, one of the very many um, names to play Robin, um, who ends up being Robin. Now I like I you know there say what you want about Batman, Batman Forever. Um you know it's definitely one I can go back and watch and I can still enjoy. Um it does have its you know cheesy parts of I've, I've always said that and I will continue to say that especially as it you know begins to age. Um I would do like the introduction to Dick Grayson and his family. You know he's with the Flying Graysons at the circus. Two Face ends up killing his family and so forth and the emotion that you know um it, when the film did take itself seriously it definitely did and that was a time you know where you know when Dick Grayson realized, you know, oh my God, my family just died and just how he's reacting and so forth. And, you know, he's so upset, of course. But when he gets to um, Wayne Manor, you know, he's just trying to play cool. He's trying to hold it together and so forth. And he's like, um, um, Commissioner Gordon brings him saying, you know, Bruce, can you take him in? He's got nowhere else to go and so forth. And it's almost like, you know, Commissioner Gordon knew, you know, that he was Batman, even though he technically didn't. Um, you know, but of course, Bruce Wayne, you know, ends up taking him in and so forth. And then, Dick Grayson stumbles on to you know, realizing, oh hey, Bruce Wayne is Batman. I'm gonna go for a, you know a ride in the Batmobile. One of the funniest thing, a couple funny things in this were, of course, when um, Bruce Wayne is with Doctor Chase Meridian and he gets a call on his watch by it's very um, James Bond like by the way, and he gets a call on his watch by Alfred and saying, "Sir, uh, there's been a problem. Um, you know, Master Grayson has uh, went on a trip in the car, sir." And he's like, "Did he boost the Jag?" The Bentley? No, sir. The other car. And it ends up being the Batmobile. And, you know, um, Robin's just, or, yeah, we'll just call him Robin's whole idea and keep saying Dick Grayson. Hey, Robin is driving around, you know, with the top down in the Batmobile, just going around and just saying, that's not Batman. That's Batboy. I can never forget that quote in there. But, uh, you know, um, it, it was... It was interesting because, you know, of course, you know, we're seeing it once again of what drives a hero to become a hero. And, you know, unfortunately, it's because of, you know, his family was murdered by a psychopath and something that 
obviously Bruce Wayne knows a lot about and so forth. So when, um, you know, eventually gets to the point where um, Robin is there. You know, he has his his flying Grayson's costume and ends up saving Batman after Two Face tried to kill him, um, and so forth. And then Grace, or Robin, makes this comment saying, "Hey, uh, I need a name, Bat Boy, Nightwing. I don't know. What do you think? What's a good sidekick name?" And like I said, I like that little kind of Easter egg that they had of Nightwing in there because we all know what you know. That's another portrayal of Robin and so forth. And there's all different kinds of sidekicks, especially in the comics and so forth. That much I do know. Um, you know, and Bruce Wayne says, how about Dick Grayson, college student? And Dick Grayson's like, screw you. It's like, I just saved your life and so forth. No matter what, no matter where Batman's going to be, um, I'm going to be and so forth. You can't stop me. And then he's like, I can stop you. And, you know, Robin makes the comment say, hey, Al. And that's what he calls Alfred this whole time. Just say, just shows you that, you know, young kid portrayal no respect for your elders and so forth i'm sounding like an old man here but besides the point though he's like hey al put this next to the bat suit where it belongs and so forth but he does make a great quote in there um you know every man has to go his own way and so forth and i do like how you know while Kilmer is my least favorite Batman, um, even as opposed to George Clooney, believe it or not, I will say that when, you know, he says, um, not just a friend, a partner with him and um, Chris O'Donnell, I really liked how they did that. Um, I really loved that. So, um, you know, as we move in here to Batman and Robin, you know, Robin is back, of course, and more of a Nightwing costume and so forth. And it's the it's the. The big theme in there, one, is that Alfred is dying and so forth. Um, another thing in here is it's about Batman being in charge. So I think one of the key scenes in here, especially for an ally scene, too, is, you know, after, you know, um, Robin makes that quote in there and so forth about saying my way or the highway, Bruce Wayne ends up visiting Alfred. And, of course, at this time, Alfred's very terminally ill and so forth. And he makes a comment pretty much saying, you know, am I, is it my way or the highway? Am I pigheaded? That yada, yada, yada. And Alfred, you know, of course, you know, is, and is, you you know, on his deathbed practically. And, but Alfred, you know, pretty much says that, Hey, yes, actually, and I'm quoting this. Yes, actually death and chance stole your parents, but rather than become a victim, you've done everything in your power to control your fates for what is Batman. If not an effort to master the chaos that sweeps our world and attempt to control death itself. And then Bruce Wayne's like, but I can't, can I? None of us can, Alfred said. And, you know, if there was ever a time, there was uh, the, the shining moment of what Batman and Robin could have been, and I'll continue to say this, it is that quote, it is that that scene right there. If they would have focused more on the, that kind of um, storyline, I would have loved that. But besides the point, that is just Alfred showing, you know, hey, I'm like your father, grandfather, trying to give you the last bit of advice that I could possibly give you, and I love that. So... Let's stop right there because I've already taken up more time than I wanted to tonight. Um, you know, there's not even going to be time for birthdays and so forth or verses. Don't worry. We will get to that next week. Um, you know, we're going to put this on pause for allies, but I will say that, you know, there is, you know, obviously a lot of allies out there. Um, you know, continue to let me know what your, who your favorite allies are. Um, we have a lot to cover the next time we do get to this second half on here. Um, so for now, that wraps it up for this episode of the Batman versus James Bond show. Please subscribe on iTunes, rate it five stars, and leave a nice little review for me on there. And like I said at the very beginning of the show, guys, please share this episode with your friends and family, whomever, and just help me get the word out there. I really appreciate that. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Batman vs. Bond and like the Batman vs. James Bond Facebook page. As I mentioned at the top of the show, you can now find the show on the BS Podcast Network and also check out all the great programming on there. Like James Bond, I will return. Until next time, I'm Brian Thomas, guys. Thanks for listening and have a great week, everyone. Peace out.